Good morning. Our study this morning is an interesting one. Of course, as we study the scriptures, it's always interesting and instructive. But this one has to do with one of the leaders of the apostolic band of Jesus Christ. That is the Apostle Peter. As the topic suggests, Peter, a coward, who became a leader. How then do we regard Peter? Do we regard him as a compromiser who would rather be expedient than scriptural? Or do we regard him as a coward who would turn his back from those who depend on him, especially at the most critical time? Or do we regard him as a committed apostle of Jesus Christ who was willing to lay down his life for the sake of his master. With the help of the Spirit of God, and as we turn to the Word of God, the Bible, these three important questions will be answered, and more than that, always sticking to the topic that we have. For our reference, we can turn to John chapter 1, Verses 35 to 42. And this is what we have from John chapter 1. Gospel of John. Chapter 1, 35 to 42. This is from the New International Version. The next day John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing, he said, Look! The Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, What do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he said, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they spent that day with him. It was about four in the afternoon. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, We have found the Messiah, that is, the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of Jonah. You will be called Cephas, which when translated is Peter. Here is the background concerning the conversion of the apostle Peter, his brother Andrew, James and John, Philip and Nathaniel. But our concern has to do with Peter. So the first point in our outline is Peter's conversion. Two things we would like for you to understand concerning this. The first one is the change of loyalty and secondly, the change of name. Change of loyalty. Because Peter, Andrew and the others were actually members of the joystick sect. But then, when the prophet John the Baptist appeared, they turned to him and followed him. So now they are disciples of John. They are well versed in the Old Testament scriptures. But since the ministry of John the Baptist has to do with repentance, now they know. Not only that they are going to follow the law of Moses, but that they have to repent if they want to account for something in the kingdom of God. But as you can see, there is something lacking in this. For repentance does not save. It only prepares the heart. We define that as turning away from our sin. That's all there is. In short, an element, a positive one, is still needed, and that is 
where the second point would show it. Chains of loyalty from John the Baptist to Jesus Christ. Ministry of repentance to faith in Jesus Christ. And we read in these verses, for example, especially after Andrew was so convinced that Jesus indeed was the Christ, that he, without hesitation, thought of his brother and brought him to him, to the Lord Jesus Christ. And upon seeing Peter, Jesus Christ said, You are Simon, son of Jonah. You shall be called Cephas. In the context of the life of Peter, this is very important because you see his name is Simon and he is the son of Jonah, of John. But now Jesus Christ said, you shall be called Cephas. That's an Aramaic name equivalent to the Greek Peter and it means a rock. Yes, a rock. There will be a time in the life of the Apostle Peter that he will be the rock. By the way, I am not intimating that I subscribe to that theory that Peter is the rock upon which the church will be built, as stated in Matthew 16, verse 18. But here, Peter would be a rock in the sense that there would be more stability in his character, unlike before he became a follower of Jesus. Notice, please, that there are also other things that are important. It seems uh, to me, although it's evident in scriptures, that there are two, there are two stages in the call of Peter, Andrew, James, and John, and the others. The first one, it says here, they were called to become disciples. So they came to Jesus. Now they know him. He is the Messiah. And he became their Lord and Master. But then when you turn to Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you will notice, especially in Matthew chapter 4, verse 19, 20, and 21, that again Jesus Christ appeared and called them. He found them fishing. So he said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. You are to fish for people. To me, this is very suggestive that the one in John chapter 1, which shows about the conversion of Peter, Andrew, James, and John, Philip, and Nathaniel, and possibly the other apostles, that was the first stage of the call. Now the second stage here, there they were called to become the disciples of Jesus Christ. But now they are called to be disciples makers. To become disciples and also to be disciple makers. Two stages, very important stages in the life of a believer, in this case, in the life of the early apostles. When we think of these things in the life of Peter, one cannot help but say that there is something that the Lord Jesus Christ has meant to be preparing Peter and the other apostles, and of course we know, he was preparing them to continue the ministry which he was starting at the time. And that they would play an important role in the kingdom of God and in the church which Jesus Christ has to start. I say has to start because it was started only after he died. That's Peter's conversion, quite clear, in two stages, change of loyalty from John to Jesus Christ, change of name 
from John to Cephas, in Greek meaning Peter, and also means it's a rock. Now, the second thing that we have to notice is Peter's threefold confession of Christ's deity. Here you will see the perceptiveness of Peter. Why among the early disciples of Jesus, at a certain point in a very specific time, he comes up always with something which amazes one who hears it. What could be the reason? Was he really spiritually deceptive? Or was it because Peter is just simply a person who would like always to be first in anything? He stands out in a crowd and he speaks many times, as we would say, he talks without thinking. And it is sometimes good, many times it's bad for him. Here we would see the good things. He is first in a threefold confession of Christ's deity. First we have in Matthew chapter 16, verse 16, when Jesus Christ was beginning his ministry, he started by asking his disciples, Who do men say that I am? They said, You must be Elijah, Elisha, or the prophet mentioned in the book of Deuteronomy. Then he turned to them and said, But how about you? To, to you, who am I? And it was Peter who blurted out. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's the first confession in Matthew 16, verse 16. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then secondly, after some time, they have been going in and out with the Lord Jesus Christ. And then there were others who followed Jesus Christ in John chapter 6. It is interesting that though the multitude of who followed Jesus Christ, when Jesus Christ said that his kingdom is not of this world, they started one after the other to turn their back and left him. Again, the Lord turned to the twelve, asked this pointed question, Will you also go away? Guess who gave the answer? It was Peter. He said in verses 68 and 69, To whom do we go? You have the words of eternal life, and I know that you are the, the Holy Son of a living God. Second confession concerning the deity of Christ. Again, it was through the Mount of Peter. And then the third time, we find this in the book of Luke, chapter 5. Wherein we read in chapter 5 in the first few verses at the beginning, up to verse 8, that Jesus Christ was walking by the Sea of Galilee, and he saw empty boats, and in there he also later on found the others of the boat, two boats, one owned by Peter in Chang and Andrew, and the other by John and James. And here he spoke to Peter, and he said, Have you caught anything? And Peter was somewhat embarrassed. Of all people and of all questions, why ask this one? They labored the whole night and caught nothing. 
knowing of course that those the Lord who started to recognize as somebody who was not an ordinary man he said Lord we have dropped the nets in all directions of this boat and caught nothing but upon your instruction I'll do it now there you are Seemingly, it is getting into Peter that the person, Jesus Christ, that they are following is not just an ordinary man. Mark the words. We have done it whole night, but caught nothing. But by your instruction, I'll do it. He did it. And the, rank, the verses from verse 4 up to verse 8 says, And they could hardly hold their net because it was filled with fish. Another version of that says it even broke. And Peter the more realized that after all his suspicion is now becoming more and more the reality I just use the word suspicion although he already made some declaration but again you know we are not very sure about Peter as we pointed out you know he just would like to be first in speaking he would just would like to stand out in the crowd so I was tempted in the sense to use the word suspicion, but now it's becoming clearer to him. It's no longer a suspicion. This is truly the Christ, the Son of the living God. And you know, the third confession, because of that he said, Go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. Luke chapter 5, verses 4 to 8. What is the implication of that? Now he realizes it's no longer just an ordinary man. But indeed, this is the Messiah. That's why he said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. Implying that now it is going deeper and deeper in his conviction that truly the master to whom he has given and pledged his loyalty and obedience is indeed the Son of God. Peter must be perceptive or was it again that in his desire to be first he uttered it and this time by coincidence he put it he made her, he said the right thing but maybe to balance it, it may not be so. Peter must be an impetuous man, sanguine in his temperament. But I'm sure his contact with Jesus Christ must have already added many things as an asset in his person. And I would like to grant him that, that now he has improved. However, for you to understand what's going on in my mind as I have compared the various passages of Scripture concerning Peter from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, I came to this conclusion just like the other expositors of the New Testament that Peter has a contrasting traits in his person or in his character. So our third point, first we have Peter's conversion. Secondly, we have Peter's threefold confession about the deity of Christ. And now this has to do with Peter's con contrasting character traits. We will see it now as we turn again to scriptures. The elements 
of nobility in his character and his sanguine temperament made him a special target of the devil. Here, we will start with this threefold boast. First, he said, Matthew 26, 33, Even if all fall away on account of you, I never will, boasted Peter. This is told the Lord. When the Lord keep on telling about, you know, the fact that his mission is really to be crucified and to give his life for many. And he said, there will become a time that he meet you my followers. You, leave, you will leave me behind. But Peter said, oh, no, 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 no. Even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. That's the first boast. Secondly, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. That's Matthew 26, verse 35. Just two verses from the first boast that he made. This one says, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And the third boast, Lord, I am ready to go with you to prison and to death. Luke 22, verse 33. Compare that with John 13, verse 37. Lord, I am ready to go with you to prison and to death. Three. Serious declarations by Peter. But even the Lord must have seen his heart and what's going on in his mind. I'm sure when Peter said it, he meant every word of it. But he must have failed to recognize or to realize the flesh is always weak, even if the spirit is willing. The Lord saw that. Because the threefold boast of Peter will now be countered by a threefold warnings of the Lord Jesus Christ. The master pressed home. The lesson he has to learn by a threefold pregnant warnings. Eh? After each statement that he made, if you turn to the passages suggested here, there always followed a warning from the Lord. So in the first statement he said, even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. He boasted. And this is what the Lord said, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sip you like wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith will never fail. Luke 22, verses 31 and 32. Yes, Simon, you said that. But be aware that the enemy has asked the Father that he will sip you like wheat. Together with the other warnings of the Lord, later on we will understand that this would lead to a very disastrous thing in the life of Peter and also a scandalous thing in the life of the Christian church. And for those who believe that he is the rock upon which the church is founded, that's a big black eye, if I may say so. A rock upon whom the church is founded. Saying this and 
Now the master himself warning him, you don't know it. But the enemy has already asked permission from the Father that he will try you and grind you like wheat. And the second warning of the Lord is immediately in Matthew 16, verse 16, he declared that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. He was commanded by the Lord, and the Lord said, Simon, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. It's quite a commendation. But the problem is that, as you keep on reading, few verses after that, the Lord said, this is my ministry. I came to give my life. And that I'm going to die for whom, for all those whom I came for. Peter recognized this and he said, Lord, it will not happen to you. Why should you die? And the Lord said, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Matthew 16, verse 23. In the earlier verses, the Lord said to him after he made that confession that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And he was commended. But this time, he is called Satan, get thee behind me. He spoke with the mind of Satan expressed in his words. Can you imagine stopping the Lord for the very purpose for which he came into this world, to die for sinners, for you and me? Who would do that? If Peter is true to his words and his confession, he would not have said it. Lord, that will not happen to you. But he did. And the Lord discerned it was spe Satan speaking through Peter. So he said, Satan, get behind me. You are always a stumbling block to me. It's quite a rebuke. And the third one, he said, Truly I tell you, Jesus answered, This very night before the cock crows, you will disown me three times. Matthew 26, verse 34, and then Matthew 26, 69 to 75. You will find it there later on when we read the denials of Peter. But in the meantime, mark this. Truly I tell you, Jesus answered, this very night before the cock rose, you will disown me three times. Why did Jesus Christ say that? Because he said, you know, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. But the Lord said, oh no. This is now the third time that he made a boast. And this is the third warning of the Lord to him. Peter, you don't know what you're talking about. But this is what I'm telling you. With all that you have said, you could be sincere, except that you do not realize and you don't understand the deeper meaning of your words. Before the cat crows cry, you will deny me thrice. That's a poignant warning from the Lord himself. But this, even this red light failed to arrest him 
or prevent his making a threefold denial. The inevitable issue of his confident boasting in Matthew 26, 39 to 45 will end up with a terrible denial of his Lord and Master so that we could have a better appreciation of that happening. Let's turn to the Word of God itself in Matthew 26, 69 to 75. Allow me, as I read from this passage, Matthew 26, 69 to 75. Remember now, the threefold boasting of Peter had been uttered. And the Lord countered, and especially at the last one, he said, Peter, tonight, something terrible will happen. Before the cock crows, you will deny me thrice. And here is what the word of God says. Now Peter was sitting out in the courtyard, and a servant girl came to him. You also were with Jesus of Galilee, she said, but he denied it before them all. I don't know what you're talking about, he said. This is after Jesus Christ had been arrested. I don't know what you are talking about, the first denial. Now verse 71. Then he went out to the gateway where another servant girl saw him and said to the people there, This fellow was with Jesus of Nazareth. He denied again with an oath. Now it's becoming serious. Not only he is denying the Lord, but this time the word of God says he denied it with an oath. I don't know the man. And the following verse says, verse 73, After a little while, those standing there went up to Peter and said, Surely you are one of them. Your accent gives you away. Now here, look at, as we read it, what was his answer. And the second one, he said it with an oath, I don't know the man. This time in verse 74, then he began to call down curses, and he swore to them, I don't know the man. He cursed, and he swore. He did not know Jesus Christ. Are you beginning? understand to realize what Peter is getting into what his master is feeling because of that and what is its impact upon the church that Jesus Christ was about to establish now, wherein Peter would be one of the leaders. The cat rose, and he has denied his Lord three times. Observe. Because this is a very serious event in the life of Peter. And the lesson we can learn as a believer in Jesus Christ, no doubt, is one. that we shall forever be thankful if we have learned it well 
unlike Peter. The red lights, the warnings have been given. The Lord must have been suggesting or hinting to Peter. Peter, be careful with what you are saying. Peter, do you realize what this is all about? Just like some people, when they say that they are corrected, they will simply say, what can I do? That's just my weakness. <laughs> That's not just a witness. That's already a pattern. But most importantly, without me judging Peter, but simply describing it before you, this is now unveiling the real person of Peter. A time of crisis, as we say, crisis does not make the man, it only reveals him. And this is Peter. When the cat crowed, he remembered the prediction of the Lord. And we read that he went out and wept bitterly. You see, allow me to add some few things here. Not only Peter. When Jesus Christ was arrested as betrayed by one of his disciples, Judas, actually, the first one to defend his master was Peter. He threw the sword and it is ended you know, by him cutting the ear of Malchus. But the Lord said, no, 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 not that. Then it says also in the gospel that the rest of the apostolic band with the exception of John and Peter following afar off, the rest of them forsook the master. So what I'm saying is that after all, it's not just Peter. But Peter, hum but the Lord has something great for Peter. Remember when he gave him a new name? You are Simon, son of John. You shall be called Cephas. That's an Aramaic name. In Greek, it means Peter, means a rock. That is something to think about. That the, the words of the Lord Jesus Christ was actually hinting on something that he was preparing for the Apostle Peter. But the greatest roadblock in all this is the person of Peter. This contrasting character traits. He said one good thing a few minutes later. It is negated by something which is not worthy to be said. So the Lord, being patient with him, but he is now, it says that he wept bitterly. For our consideration, any help to us. If you will analyze the failure of Peter, it, there are four contributing factors. One, remember, it was a progressive thing. It says that he presumed an exception the possibility of failure. That's why he uttered these words, his boasting. The Apostle Paul has a good reminder for each of us in relation to 
how we would treat ourselves, you see. First Corinthians 10, 12. Therefore, if any man thinks so highly of himself, he has to be very careful, lest you fall. A good warning. The second thing we notice about Peter, his communion with the Lord was broken. Remember at the night at Gethsemane, together with the other apostles, the Lord invited them to come with him and pray. They went to sleep. Peter was one of them. And then when Jesus Christ was arrested, while John followed all the way up to the judgment hall, we read that Peter followed from a distance. And the last one, of course, is at that moment, he was with a doubtful company. He warmed himself around the fire with all those who are enemies of the Lord. That was there when his threefold denial just made their way. So remember, my friend, the lessons are there for us always, regardless of what situation there is. Let's take not only him, but learn this lesson quite well. <clears throat> So the last one that we are about to study in relation to all this is Peter's restoration and commission. So we have Peter's conversion, Peter's threefold confession, Peter's contrasting character traits, and then it ended up with his downfall, with his denial, and now Peter's restoration. In Peter's restoration, we are afforded a comforting insight into the master's method with those who have fallen, who have failed and fallen. It is not by chance that Peter's threefold boast and denial were complemented by his master's threefold question and commission. This time, I'll ask you, to turn your Bibles to John chapter 21. John chapter 21. Just a short background of this, and then we, short while, we shall be through with our study. But it is very important. John 21, starting from verse 15. But as you know, this is the post resurrection appearance of Jesus Christ. Where is Peter now? Oh, Peter. He went out and wept bitterly. Yes, he cried. But remember, tears are not enough as evidence of a truly repentant heart. Repentance must take place. Tears are not enough as cathartic element. The Lord was starting to show to Peter, realizing that there is sincerity in the man's action. When the Lord looked at him, he was touched, served out, and wept bitterly. And then on the morning of the resurrection, when the women went to the tomb, they did not find the Lord, but they found a man, presumably an angel, who said, it's not here, he has reason. But what is important here is that there was a statement uttered that must have given hope for Peter. 
And he said, tell his disciples and Peter that he will be, he will meet them in Galilee. Tell his disciples and Peter. Why do you think he was named in a special way? I guess your, your guess is right as good as mine. The Lord wanted for him to know that when he wept bitterly, God saw his heart. There is great hope for Peter and for that matter for any person who recognizes the sins before God and willing to repent as Peter did not unlike Judas as was a remorse so there they were Let's cut short this encounter and proceed to the actual meeting between Peter and the Lord. After they have eaten, Peter was probably just expecting that the Lord will reprimand him in the presence of the other apostles. But the Lord you know, did not do that. But the Lord wanted for him to say something in the presence of the other apostles because the sin he committed was a public one and therefore it must be done publicly in a sense but still the compassion the love and the concern for him are all there so three times he denied his Lord. The commitment was broken. He lost his position in the apostolic band because of that. Who would follow him if he leaves? No one. But God has a plan for him. So the Lord took this opportunity by asking him the first question. Simon do you love me more than this? Mark. He did not call him Peter or Cephas, but Simon. The name he had before his encounter with Jesus Christ in John chapter 1. Why? In the mind of the Lord, Peter at this point must have lost already his position in the apostolic band. But that was not the end. And it will be his attitude. And his answer is, Yes, Lord, I love you. And the Lord said, Feed my lambs. Still, the Lord asked him the second time, Peter, Simon, do you love me? And he said, Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Then the Lord said, Get my sheep, tend my sheep. The third time, the same thing. Let me just now explain this. Three times he denied the Lord. Three times he has to make a reaffirmation of his love for the Lord. And also, here, the use of the word love. And the first question, Peter. Simon, do you love me? The Lord used the word agape, which is actually one that speaks of total commitment. But Peter answered, Philio. Yes, he showed his love for the Lord, but his commitment was not as total as what the Lord was expecting. And so the second time, so in the third time, the Lord took him at his level. And the word used is believe. And Peter, as he has repented, recognized that he had sinned against the Lord and reaffirmed his love this time, 
he received a commission. Three reaffirmations with a threefold commission. Feed my lambs, tend my sheep, feed my sheep. And then another word there is that when the Lord said, moved, he said, Peter, follow me. To all and sundry, the Lord was making it known that Peter has been restored and he is now back as an apostle. Some of you may question my statement that he must have lost his place in the apostolic band. Certainly. He had been conferred that honor. But at the most critical time, he disowned the Lord. There could not be any other conclusion but that. However, and the plan of God that was not the end for him, it was only the beginning of a greater something if he did the right thing and he did. He confessed it, he recognized it, repented of it, and now the Lord's favor is back, fully restored. And what was the end of it? Just three minutes, let me just close this message. After that incident, we turn to the book of Acts. On the day of Pentecost, Peter was the preacher. 3,000 souls were saved. In Acts chapter 3, the first miracle in a Christian church in Jerusalem, Peter was the one who performed it. The layman miraculously healed. And then you notice that in Acts chapter 8, it was Peter and John used by God to pray for the Samaritan Christians who received the Spirit of God through the ministry of Peter in John. And of course, Acts chapter 10, it was Peter who witnessed the first Gentile convert, Cornelius, in his household. That is a fulfillment of the protection of the keys of the kingdom entrusted to Peter. Without any doubt, you turn from Acts chapter 1 to Acts chapter 12. In the history of the first Christian congregation in Jerusalem, it's Peter who dominated these chapters to show that he was fully restored and for the very purpose for which God was preparing him, now is accomplished. And he even was martyred, crucified, because of his love for his master. But he did not want to be crucified just like his master. So, it is said, he was crucified upside down. Beloveds, beloved and brothers and sisters said Christ, Let's not be hard on Peter, but rather learn the few lessons that the Lord would like for us to learn this morning. God bless you all.